The element phosphorus is an interesting example of an element that forms two allotropic forms. The two varieties which commonly occur are known as white phosphorus and red phosphorus. White phosphorus is in the tube on the right. It's the form that is prepared by the condensation of phosphorus vapor. And when freshly prepared, is white. However, this form of the element is metastable and slowly turns to the red form, even at room temperature. For this reason, the piece of phosphorus in the tube has a yellowish appearance due to a small surface coating of the red variety. Red phosphorus occurs in the tube on the left. It's the stable form at room temperature. These two uh, forms of phosphorus also exhibit several remarkably different kinds of behavior. The white form, as we'll soon see, bursts into flame and air, whereas the red form is quite stable and less heated. Because of this tendency of the white form to burst into flame, it must be stored under water. And that is the reason for the liquid in the tube on the right. We can compare the activity of red phosphorus and white phosphorus by exposing samples of them to the air. On the watch glass on the left, I've placed a small sample of red phosphorus. The watch glass on the right has been warmed very slightly. And on that watch glass, I'll now place a sample of white phosphorus. You can see that the white phosphorus almost immediately bursts into flame and burns with the production of large clouds of phosphorus pentoxide, where under virtually identical conditions, the red phosphorus does not react with the oxygen in the air at any appreciable rate. Since phosphorus is a non-metal, its oxide, formed during the combustion, should react with water to produce an acid. Some of the phosphorus pentoxide will have remained on the watch glass. And I'll now add a few drops of water to the residue on the glass. Now I'll add a few drops of methyl red indicator. You'll recall that this indicator assumes its red color in acid solution. And the appearance of the bright red color uh, confirms our prediction that phosphorus pentoxide will react with water to form an acid solution. Red phosphorus, like white, will burn in air if it's raised to a somewhat higher temperature. On the watch glass, we have a few small pieces of red phosphorus. And I will now light these with the flame of the Bunsen burner. You can see that the phosphorus ignites easily and that the red phosphorus burns, producing the same clouds of white smoke that we observe with the white phosphorus. And the product of the reaction is the same, phosphorus pentoxide. We'll permit the red phosphorus uh, to burn until virtually all of it has been used up, and then test the residue with water and methyl red as we did before. The red phosphorus has now burned itself out, and the watch glass uh, has been permitted to cool. We'll add a few drops of water and some methyl red indicator as before. And again, the bright red color of the indicator tells us that the solution is acid. It is acid because the P2O5 phosphorus pentoxide formed when the red phosphorus burned has reacted with the water to form phosphoric acid. White phosphorus reacts rather rapidly with most of the halogens. We can illustrate this reaction by putting a small piece of white phosphorus on the watch glass and to it adding some crystals of iodine. The heat of the reaction causes the phosphorus to burst into flame the product of the reaction is phosphorus triiodide, 
and the balance of the phosphorus is now simply burning, forming phosphorus pentoxide. We observed that when a piece of white phosphorus was placed on the watch glass, it almost immediately burst into flame and produced uh, large clouds of white smoke. The reaction involved was between phosphorus and oxygen, yielding the phosphorus pentoxide, a white powder, which caused the smoke. We then added some water to the residue on the watch glass and tested with an indicator. When the oxides of phosphorus, like P2O5, react with water, the initial product is metaphosphoric acid. And this then may react with an additional molecule of water to yield orthophosphoric acid. And both of these acids ionize, yielding hydrogen ions, which we detected with the indicator. The reactions we observed with red phosphorus were entirely similar. The phosphorus in this equation then may be either white or red. The equation is the same, producing P2O5, and then of course the subsequent equations are the same also. When we treated a small piece of phosphorus with crystals of iodine, we found that a rapid reaction took place with the production of phosphorus triiodide. When phosphorus reacts with an active metal, such as calcium, a compound called calcium phosphide is formed. This material also results from the reduction of calcium phosphate. Calcium phosphide, Ca2P3, reacts with slightly acidified water to produce mostly phosphine, PH3, and trace impurities of another hydride of phosphorus, P2H4. When these compounds come in contact with the air, the P2H4 ignites spontaneously, setting off the phosphine, so that little puffs of flame result. I'll now place several lumps of calcium phosphide in the water in the beaker so that you may observe this reaction. Down here, the calcium phosphide is reacting with the water, forming bubbles of phosphine. These rise to the surface and ignite here, giving puffs of flame and producing fumes of phosphorus pentoxide. Some water is formed also. We saw that when we reacted small lumps of calcium phosphide, the A3P2, with water, the reaction took place rapidly with the production of calcium hydroxide and phosphine, the gas which bubbled from the reaction mixture. The phosphine may contain traces of other halides of phosphorus which ignite spontaneously and then set off the phosphine. But in any case, at the surface of the water in the reaction vessel, when the phosphine encounters the oxygen in the air, it does burn with the production of phosphorus pentoxide and water as shown by this equation. We turn now to a consideration of some reactions of the phosphate ion. In each of the two test tubes, I've placed several milliliters of a solution of sodium phosphate. And to each tube, I'll add a few drops of silver nitrate solution. The yellow precipitate is silver phosphate. Now we've seen before that we can dissolve a precipitate if we can cause the product of the concentrations of its ions raised to the appropriate power to fall below the solubility product constant for this precipitate. In the case of silver phosphate, we can lower the concentration of either the phosphate ion or of the silver ion. To the tube on the left, I'll add some dilute nitric acid. And you can see that this precipitate rapidly dissolves. Now the dilute nitric acid reacts with the phosphate ion, converting it to phosphoric acid, and so reducing the concentration of the phosphate ion that the solubility product conditions are not met. To the tube on the right, I'll add some concentrated ammonium hydroxide. And once again, the precipitate dissolves.
The ammonium hydroxide reacts with a silver ion, forming the silver ammonia complex ion and reducing the concentration of the silver ion. So in this case, by reducing the concentration of the phosphate ion, we've caused the precipitate to dissolve. And in this case, by reducing the concentration of the silver ion, we've caused the precipitate to dissolve. When we mix solutions of silver nitrate and sodium phosphate, we obtain a precipitate of silver phosphate. This precipitate must have been obtained because the product of the concentration of the silver ion cubed times the phosphate ion concentration exceeded the solubility product constant for silver phosphate. We then divided this precipitate into two sections and treated one section with acid. We observed that the precipitate dissolved. Nitric acid was used as a source of the hydrogen ion. Now when the precipitate dissolved, it must have done so because the silver ion concentration cubed times the phosphate ion became less than the solubility product constant. Now in the case of the acidification of silver phosphate precipitates, we were operating on the small quantity of phosphate ion in equilibrium with the precipitate. When we added acid, this phosphate ion was converted to the hydrogen phosphate ion, and in the presence of additional acid, would go to the dihydrogen phosphate ion and eventually to phosphoric acid. In any case, however, the phosphate ion concentration is greatly reduced. This term becomes very small, and this product, this quantity times this quantity, with this very small, is less than the solubility product constant, and the precipitate dissolves. Now when we added ammonia to solutions or suspensions of silver phosphate, we're operating on the silver ion in equilibrium with this precipitate. The silver ion reacts with two molecules of ammonia to produce the silver ammonia complex ion. This lowers the concentration of the silver ion, making this term very small, and once again, the product of these two terms is smaller than the solubility product constant, so the precipitate dissolves. A common test for the phosphate ion involves its reaction with solutions of ammonium molybdate in the presence of nitric acid. In the test tube, we have a few milliliters of a solution of sodium phosphate. To this solution, I'll add a small quantity of ammonium molybdate solution. And we'll then make the mixture acid with nitric acid. The yellow precipitate which forms in the tube is ammonium phosphomolybdate. The formation of this precipitate with its characteristic yellow color serves as a good test for the presence of the phosphate ion. We'll now utilize the test we've just developed to study the reaction between red phosphorus and nitric acid. I have a small quantity of red phosphorus in this uh, brown bottle. Now place uh, gram or so of this material in the beaker. We'll now add some dilute nitric acid to the beaker also. We'll then place the Bunsen burner under the setup and boil the mixture for several minutes. After several minutes of boiling, the reaction mixture has been permitted to cool somewhat, and we will now filter to remove excess phosphorus. To the filtrate from the reaction between the red phosphorus and the nitric acid, We'll add a few milliliters of ammonium molybdate, and then some additional concentrated nitric acid. The appearance of the yellow precipitate of ammonium phosphomolybdate confirms our suspicion that the red phosphorus has been oxidized to the phosphate ion or to phosphoric acid by the action of the nitric acid. We developed a test for the presence of the phosphate ion by treating a solution containing the phosphate ion with an excess of nitric acid 
and a solution of ammonium molybdate containing the molybdate ion MOO4 double minus. Now we obtained a yellow precipitate and this precipitate may have a rather variable composition but one author at least represents it as the ammonium ion taken three times four hydrogens phosphorus attached to six MO2O7 groups. This is called ammonium phosphomolybdate. The other product of the reaction is water. And this material precipitates is yellow and serves as an identification of the phosphate ion. We then reacted red phosphorus with dilute nitric acid. We found that the equation can be balanced by the half reaction method with the phosphorus being oxidized to the phosphate ion. Four waters are required, eight hydrogens and five electrons needed for balancing. The nitrate ion in dilute concentration is reduced to nitric oxide. Three electrons are required for balancing. So this equation must be multiplied by three and this by five for electrical balance. And adding the two partials up, we obtain uh, three phosphorus atoms, two molecules of water from the 12 waters that entered in this partial and the 10 molecules of water produced in this partial, leaving a net of two here, and five nitrate ions producing three phosphate ions and four hydrogens from the 24 hydrogens in the top partial and the 20 hydrogens in the bottom, a net of four on the right, and five molecules of nitric oxide. We then added ammonium molybdate and excess nitric acid and tested for the phosphate ions here in the same manner uh, that we did previously and again obtained uh, the yellow precipitate having this composition.